Hey everyone, before we jump into this, I just wanted to include a trigger warning because this episode discusses gender-based violence in the Indian and Pakistani contexts mostly. Great. Thanks. All right. Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm discussing quite a few different topics. Uh, I guess focusing on, and excuse my pronunciation, discussing the work of Sadat Hassan Manto. Yes. And... <laughs> Indian Pakistani how would you what how would well um well Manto was definitely born uh in India when it was not partitioned when India did not divide into India and Pakistan so definitely he was um an Indian writer who captured the horrors of uh, of the of the violence and the madness of the partition, and then he later migrated to Pakistan. Right, right. So we're going to be. I'm joined by Deplina, and we're going to be discussing his work, including a myriad other topics around the issue of Indian partition, uh, which we'll get into um, in a lot more detail. Uh, before jumping into that, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you want to mostly see pictures of my cats, um, you can uh, find this in podcast form if you're listening to it on YouTube, pretty much anywhere you get podcasts. Or if you're uh, listening to this in podcast form, you can go to YouTube um, on which sometimes I include videos that you might um, like to see for whatever reason. Um you can also support me by subscribing, liking, sharing, you know, telling your friends. Who knows? They might they might love it. Uh, you can contribute monetarily, but I would like to say first for you to take care of yourself. Uh, and, you know, if you're considering donating to me now, consider deferring that and maybe giving to an organization in need, uh, be it Black Lives Matter or any other organization representing uh, a marginalized group or a group doing uh, work and any part of the world that happens to need help, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I present you Deplina. And Deplina, what do you do? What What is your claim to fame? So I am a PhD student going to my second year in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, my research lies at the intersection of genocide, humanitarian assistance, and sexual violence, and I'm particularly interested to investigate the Rohingya genocide. And yes, I'm. I would. I think <laughs> I identify myself as a feminist killjoy because uh, I kind of tend to. Um, I think now see the problems around uh, gender-based exploitation and economic inequality and the way it disproportionately affect women and gender minority uh, groups and other uh, you know individuals who are at the margins. So I don't think I would um, I, I I can say that I uh, really enjoy reading or you know reading some post or or watching a movie with a really free mind like I used to do before starting my PhD and now like if something is problematic that becomes so visible to me I'm like oh that's problematic I shouldn't be you know kind of sympathizing with those values and that is why I kind of uh, find a lot of uh, Bollywood movies that I grew up with um, in my childhood to be very problematic and I was like dang I did grow up with these movies and these were presented to me and I kind of uh, you know glorified it celebrated it only to realize now that those were so problematic right yeah right. Um, so the work of or the work the you know literary contribution of mm -hmm. Sadat uh, Hassan Manto comes well following uh, did he write before the partition? 
if well, you know. That. Well, yes, he did write uh, before the partition. I think he started writing from, um, if I'm not mistaken, from mid 1930s. And uh, but I think the stories that stu- like he he had. Uh, written a number of stories on different issues, but the stories that stood out to me was his stories around the partition that captured uh, the madness of the uh, partition, the mayhem, the violence, and uh, most importantly, I think, uh, David, when you asked me, like, how do I see Manto, whether he was an Indian writer or a Pakistani writer? You know, now when I think about it after some, like, seconds of just, you know, kind of brainstorming the question in my mind, I kind of think he was the author from the Indian subcontinent because he believed in the essence of humanity and he believed that, you know, the partition that was essentially a product of uh, communal, uh, uh, I think, disharmony between between communities. And of course, the way the British had uh, presented the, the communities and have pitted them against each other. So he did not believe in that. He believed in the essence of humanity and he critiqued the partition because he was at that time capturing and recording the violence that men were committing against each other. That was not called for. A country was divided. A country was, you know, the borders of the country was being rewritten, but the price was paid by common people. A nation was built on the bodies of men, women, and children. Yeah. Um, And just in case there's someone, you know, listening who doesn't necessarily know, what was the partition and what did it result in? So the Indian independence movement uh, culminated uh, into the partition in 1947 when India gained um, its independence and the uh, and and the two nation theory uh, had gained momentum long back in the 1920s um, and there was already and um, you know a call for uh, separating the Muslim community from India and for them to have an independent state With of Pakistan. their own yes as Pakistan and uh, you know the movement was headed by uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who who later became the state leader of Pakistan. So it was essentially kind of the borders were redrawn because uh, Pakistan was supposed to be a separate Muslim state that would cater to the Muslim population. And India was supposed to, well, you know, predominantly have a Hindu population, but there were many Muslims who decided to stay back in India. And when and when this, you know, this rearranging of the borders were taking place, so many families were uprooted from their homes, were uprooted from their villages where they were born, where they were raised, because we are talking about a time where people were very connected to the soil, to the land where they were born. And... Uh, you know, after after 200 years of colonial rule and being under the, um, the, the, the British imperialism, the idea was to have an independent nation that would cater to Indians. Right. But before that could happen, India was divided into, you know, Hindus and Muslims. So there was two. I mean, what I what I really kind of feel and to this day what I think is I have not witnessed the partition. I am a secondary witness of the partition because I've I've I have read um the you know the way partition has been captured in popular literature and and uh, interviews and videos um of partition survivors 
And to this day, I think that, you know, the partition was a political choice. I'm not getting into the debate of whether it could be averted or not. Mm. But I think, you know, this choice was not given to the people. The people did not, you know, have the choice to kind of say that, hey, I don't want to be uprooted from my home, from my mm. family, where I lived. I mean, definitely there was a call for, you know, for, for Muslims to feel safe in a, in a different state and for, for India to kind of be a country that would cater to both Hindus and Muslims because, like I said, that many Muslims uh, decided to stay back and mm-hmm. they were welcome in the country. But what is the cost of the partition? We, we often talk about, you know, the politics of the partition, whether it was a political choice, how it could be averted. But I do not find a lot of engagement I mean, there are scholarly engagement, of course, but engagement among people like us, like who are a product of the partition, like my my grandparents were refugees. Right. And I do not like even in my family with my you know cousins and siblings, I've never sat down with them and talked about the human cost of partition. What was the human value of partition? Like, what did the partition actually result in? Yeah. And and Monto captures yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and being uh, a literary writer, he was writing fiction, mm-hmm. a lot of it, right? Mm-hmm. But but it was historically motivated. Like Yes. He was, and there was um, from this article, and I should give credit to the uh, article titled Memories of Partition Revisiting Sadat Hassan Monto by uh, Sudha Tawari. And s- they make the case that historians have forgotten the real people's experiences, mm-hmm. choosing instead to focus on what they call high politics, mm-hmm. like focusing on the dominant yeah, voices yeah. and forgetting the day-to-day voices, women, children, marginalized, even men, like that were of uh, lower classes, lower mm-hmm. castes. So how did Monto capture that in, in his writings? Like how did, how did he do it? Um, yeah, there are a couple of short stories of Manto that that stood out to me. And personally, I think um, among many Manto enthusiasts, if I may put it that way, um, Tanda Ghosh, the cold meat, okay. uh, cold dough, like, I think it, it translates to this cream. And... Um, these are, uh, these are three stories that particularly stood out to me as they captured the madness, the mayhem, the violence that was the Indian partition. And uh, with Toba Teik Singh, it's, it's really interesting because uh, Manto, I mean, these are short stories, but Manto was brilliantly capturing the trauma of the partition right where um, this man um, you know Bisan Singh he is um, I mean I do not want to give away spoilers if, if somebody <laughs> someone is, might go and read it yeah. yeah if somebody is interested to read it but you know for this man Bisan Singh who has been in a in a in, in a state asylum for um um I I beg your apology for using the term lunatics. That's how you know Manto uses the term. Right. So, and and he kind of he struggles with his identity mm-hmm. because he's un, unsure. You know, along with other of his inmates, that where is India and where is Pakistan? So if they are in Pakistan. Where is India? And if they are in India, then where does Pakistan locate? You know, where, where one can locate Pakistan's map in the, in, in the world map. So there's a lot of confusion about, you know, among common people. Like Manto actually addresses and reflects these questions that people had. Like, where do we belong? You know, one night we were, you know, on this side of the border where we belong to India. 
And after the partition, now suddenly we are uprooted. Suddenly we are told that we do not have ties with the land where we were born. We do not have ties with the land that kind of provided us with food, shelter, identity. Yeah, yeah. And those things are very well connected. That is identity and and Mm -hmm. land. So if you were a Muslim person in what is now uh, kind of bordered as India, Mm -hmm. at the time, I guess you were expected to, Mm -hmm. you know, just pick up and go to Pakistan in order to live your life. Um, whether or not people did that was up to them, as you, as you said. Like, many people decided to stay. Yes, there were, you know, I mean, majorly people were expected to kind of pack their belongings. But with the drawing and, of the border, was that, that must have been difficult for those people that were kind of, you know, at the time close to the border. Like, how do you navigate this? Like, where well, do we- I think, you know, that is, that is very interesting because the Indian partition that actually result i mean the indian partition witnessed the largest refugee movement in in history really yes and uh, there were there were millions of people who were crossing the borders and i should note that you know when the borders were redrawn well west pakistan you know, Pakistan was essentially had had like two parts. Like, uh, Pakistan became West Pakistan, the Pakistan that you know as Pakistan now. Right. And yeah. then Bangladesh became East Pakistan. Mm. So you see, the movement was happening on both sides of the border, like on both sides of the country. There was movement that was happening in the northern side of the border, where people were migrating from Punjab. You know predominantly Punjab because that was closer to the borders and from Bengal and you know people were migrating from from you know what we know as West Bengal and you know now what we know as Bangladesh people were not sure if they were welcome right in the in the in the communities where they lived together where they survived you know natural calamities where they where they took part in um you know the struggle for independence where they were walking shoulder to shoulder where they were maybe you know kind of sitting under the stars and and just contemplating about about life Mm -hmm. so what does partition mean for for the common people and like you said, um, what we now know to be, you know, Pakistan and India, uh, and then Bangladesh, Sri mm-hmm. Lanka, the other products of uh, partition, was built off of a lot of suffering. Yeah. A lot of suffering by poor people, by women, by mm-hmm. children. Yeah. You know, people that didn't have a lot of power. Mm-hmm. But for you and you're you're particularly interested in this and you feel that Monto really captures this the experience of women specifically is something very notable yes women as a result of partition and the kinds Mm -hmm. of violences that were directed between uh you know Muslim uh people in Pakistan and Hindu people in Mm -hmm. uh India and how women were almost like a like a battleground in themselves where they were a site to to exert dominance where if you could control the other people's women if you could abduct you know assault rape other people's women then you would be able to conquer the other people Mm -hmm. so what does that mean then as for india pakistan today for you know their identities as nations if they are founded upon this violence it's a very, very loaded question. It's a loaded question. Um, I have, uh, I have a lot of uh, thoughts on this, and um, I would, you know, unpack it one by one. Yeah. Uh, because, as you said, that it's it's pretty loaded, and uh, um, I think the way I perceive the process of nas- of of national identity formation or nation building is uh it's very different from 
maybe you know some from from one of my contemporaries from somebody else who is of a different opinion but uh, i kind of you know struggle a lot with the idea of nation building mm. especially a nation that is built on bodies of violence right a nation that is um you know i i think you know for both india and pakistan um i would give due credit to pandit jawahar lal nehru and the you know and and the subsequent prime ministers uh, who who invested into making i i do not want to speak for pakistan because sure. yeah i do not essentially share their culture their history post partition so i i would not speak for them but definitely i i think you know with the process of nation building in india there was a lot of focus on on you know on the non alignment policy where india was an emerging power where india was a developing power and you know like the indian partition was followed by the cold war in 1950s where the world right. was divided into two camps mm-hmm. the capitalist camp and the socialist camp and it was on the developing countries to kind of to choose a side like, oh yeah they like, sure. you know where where they would position themselves whether with the us or whether with the ussr um but you know with india trying to actively devise and follow the non alignment policy and the policy of peaceful coexistence um and really doing quite well with it but what about the women who were still struggling with PTSD from the partition violence mm-hmm. who were struggling to be accepted in in their societies and their families um manto really kind of you know uh, hints on this um in one of his stories um he kind of uh, suggests that many men and you know many men who abducted women like you know these women who were abducted they were sometimes integrated into the families and sometimes they were married to their abductors and um in his story kudaki kasam um in the name of god uh he kind of uh, you know he he writes this very beautiful short story about an estranged daughter and um and and a mother who his who is frantically looking for her daughter and uh, she would you know she would she would spend days and nights on the street in deplorable condition um uh, but would still not uh give up the quest of finding her daughter and she would she would go on the streets and you know just you know ask the police man whether you know he has seen her daughter so uh towards the end manto kind of tells the readers that uh uh there was a woman who was walking uh with an indian man uh, i mean with a hindu man and um and uh i think she was in a veil or she was wearing a ghungat or dupatta and um some and uh, the man tells this woman that isn't she your mother and the woman doesn't you know kind of acknowledge her mother and the mother kind of screams bhagbari bhagbari because because she is devastated to know that her daughter refuses to acknowledge her to identify her because you know post partition she might have found a stability a peace in 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 this new life that she shares with this man and she does not want to necessarily go back to a situation where she would make herself more vulnerable to 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 violence to attacks by acknowledging her mother so you know these these uh, i think uh, 
the the question then you ask is how how is it uh moral that you do not connect with your with your mother with somebody who gave birth to you and how far would you go to you know to kind of completely denounce that relationship in order to kind of not um compromise or destabilize the the relationship that or the stability the new found stability and peace that you have found after you know periods of violence and um and and communal riots and attacks like it's almost safer to choose this yes Im- immediate you know you have this man here yes. and you have this identity yeah. uh then to go back to something that you are perhaps unsure about because mm-hmm. you know there you've gone through all this trauma and in this process of mm-hmm. trauma and this violence you don't come out the same person no. but other people don't necessarily know that and that's one of the stories i kind of know about from this you mm-hmm. know article i i read um but i and i should have said this at the beginning i know very little about this topic generally um but yeah it seems as though she had no choice mm-hmm. but to embrace this new identity mm-hmm. and it speaks to what i know about monto being someone that you know is a muslim man who mm-hmm. who is born in india mm-hmm. but who identified after the partition mm-hmm. b- being a pakistani yeah. person and not and kind of um existing on the um on the borderlands as mm-hmm. you know Anzal Dua says it in uh you know in the Latin America mm-hmm. uh context um kind of on the on the yeah. borders not yeah. knowing where to where to fit mm-hmm. uh and for a lot of people it's probably just easier to take that immediate option whatever mm-hmm. seems the most safe at the time which is mm-hmm. how i understood that one story yeah. that i knew about but that's really yeah uh, and how it was described in the article was that monto had a dual belonging like yes. he, he he i mean he 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 lived in in bombay for a for a, for a long part of his life he i think he also worked in bombay talkies if i'm not mistaken i might be wrong in that but he did you know work in the entertainment industry he had colleagues and and close friends among hindu colleagues so he necessarily did not see them as hindu yeah he saw them as a friend as a colleague as a co-worker and i think this feeling of you know of being bitter towards the um uh, the political um result uh of the partition or the politics of partition reflects in his stories where he constantly tries to kind of you know bring to the readers that see this is the human cost of partition there are people who are being uprooted from their from their homes there are people who are being killed on on trains and carriages or on roads and people are not just identified as people people are being marked with religious symbol people are becoming the symbol of their religion so people are not indian anymore or they do not belong to the indian subcontinent anymore they are either hindus they are either muslims right and for either communities they justified the violence mm-hmm. because you know the the justification was but the other party violated us you know first so we are just retaliating right so i kind of find you know that that i kind of find I I really struggle with the the voices that are presented to us in the mainstream historical narratives. It's it's almost out of, you know, interest after reaching a certain age that, you know, that I started engaging with partition literature with the gendered aspect of partition literature with the with the way i kind of saw that a nation 
was built on on women's bodies mm -hmm. nationality was marked on women's bodies yeah women were the markers of the ethnicity where they belonged the question that i always ask myself and i wish i could you know ask uh, the political leaders at that time was did the woman you know did this individual woman sign up for this violence mm -hmm. Did she choose to be a part of this violence? Did you actually think about, you know, all that is going to happen that, you know, for generations, you know, people are going to live with this trauma and not necessarily acknowledge that trauma, but this intergenerational trauma of partition of, you know, I, I have, uh, I have uh, heard my grandmother kind of say that when she was a little girl, how she had to cross the border with her uh, family and how her parents would often tell her that, you know, they kind of they kind of found it hard to adjust, to live in a land that was so distant from home. They, they had to start from scratch. They, they had to begin from the point where they left everything and they kind of had to rebuild everything right from the beginning, right from the scratch. My, like, I, I always, I, I mean, again, maybe this is the killjoy in me, but <laughs> I always struggle with the question of, you know, who made the choice and who paid the price? Yeah. So this is what I, I always struggle with. Yeah, because there were no women uh, making these decisions in, yes. in politics, you know, among the British mm -hmm. that were, you know, marking mm -hmm. out these new borders. Yet they experienced a lot of the, mm -hmm. the hardships. And additionally, people of lower classes, lower castes mm -hmm. that experienced this, all the harms disproportionately mm -hmm. Because it was a major uh, kind of overturning of what everyone knew to be the regular daily life. Like, yeah, yeah. It, but on the on the one hand, it is it, it was a good move in that it gave some people a sense of identity that they could associate, be it Muslim people or Hindu people, mm -hmm. with a, with a n new territory they thought was theirs mm -hmm. or understood to be theirs. But at like what cost? Like how is these costs? Um, kind of played out and against whom were they played out and like you, that's why you have the work of uh monto really capturing that and like mm -hmm. you said that story of this woman who doesn't even recognize you know, her mother her own mother because she doesn't she lives on this in the borders between yeah. you know who she is now who she was choosing you know or maybe she doesn't choose it she she might not even mm. know but I, i'm Again, I know nothing about this. Ever. No, but it's it's just, you know, wonderful to kind of engage with a colleague on 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 the issues on the on the human cost of partition, on the gendered aspect of partition, because I mean honestly it, it doesn't get a lot talked about. Like of course there are, you know, there are um scholars who are working on these issues who are um who are actively trying to engage with these issues but for the common people for the common masses i i really wonder if they at all engage with with the questions of identity mm -hmm. and of loss of the loss of um, innocence the loss of life and the and here, you know, when I say loss of life, I do not necessarily mean that, you know, you die and you lose your life. But um, in in Manto's uh, short story that um, that I mentioned briefly before, Koldo, uh, I think it translates it as uh, the scream. Uh, Manto really depicts the impact of sexual violence rape on women where uh, you know towards the end of the story the again this is this is an estranged daughter like some uh, 
this this woman goes by the name of Sakina. She was separated uh, from her father while she was crossing the border. And then, you know, the father goes on looking for her and he kind of asks um, a young group of, you know, men who were volunteering with the with the search party and, you know, kind of helping um you know, these people who were crossing in numbers, who were, who were crossing the borders in numbers to relocate, he kind of asks them if, if they know about Sakina. Uh, he describes Sakina to them. And it's interesting how Manto kind of, uh, you know, uh, brings the reader. Manto kind of takes the reader along with him in a journey. For me, when I was reading the story in... 2019, I could see, I could like, you know, visualize the events happening in front of my eyes. I could, sure. I could, I could see, yes, those were, you know, a series of words written on a piece of paper, printed on a piece of paper. But the events, but my imagination was actively, you know, reproducing the imageries. And I could see a father, you know, frantically looking for uh, for for his daughter and I kind of I mean without even you know kind of I don't know without even telling myself I kind of positioned myself in that place like what would happen if I I'm very close to my father what would happen if I kind of you know got separated from my father yeah how would I navigate that how would my father feel and then you know I think this is what they call vicariously living the trauma and, you know, being a secondary witness to the partition. Um, and when to the point where Manto kind of, like I said, that Manto takes his readers along with him on a journey. And when we reach to the point where we see that this young girl is found uh, by this group of volunteers who first earn her trust, provide her with food, and then end up raping her mm. a number of times. So how does trust, morality, and ethics play out? Right. Manto is not only pointing out, you know, to the, to the crisis of humanity, but Manto is also pointing out that, you know, there are circumstances, there are times when women become the, when women's bodies become the carriers of their ethnicity. Yeah. Of where, where women's bodies are hypersexualized and objectified to a point that violating it, raping the body is normalized. It's, I mean, I kind of, you know, I kind of think, would the men think that, you know, what they were doing was actually violating a woman? Because for them, probably the woman did not have the choice to resist them. The woman did, probably, you know, Pancho does not tell us that, but I would like to think that she did. But what choice did she have? And, and then Manto kind of, you know, takes us towards the climax where the woman is found in a in a in a refugee camp and uh, her father kind of finds her there and uh, she's bruised she is she's obviously you know um lying there uh, because of all you know lying there kind of unconscious or maybe in a state of semi-consciousness because of the assault that she has endured and the doctor walks in and it's it's a it's a dark room and the doctor walks in and the doctor asks uh, one of his attendees to kind of open the window and it acts as a trigger you know it acts as a response and immediately the trigger kind of demands a response and almost immediately, the woman kind of tries and I mean, she, she, she kind of unfastens the 
her, her trousers. Right. It's like she, open the window, and she knew open. Men. Yes, and and or, she she parts her legs. Right. So. To to be read again because. She she has you know normalized the assault to a point where she equates it with her survival. Mata does not tell us how many times she was raped or sexually violated or the or the way she was sexually violated, but the impact that it left on a woman who you know whose whose immediate response to an otherwise innocent phrase is to unfasten her trousers and and you know part open her legs to be raped again tells you a lot about the crisis of trauma yeah like how trauma is kind of embedded how the trauma is naturalized how the trauma is normalized and how trauma becomes a part of her identity she's not able to distinguish that's how i read it she's not able to distinguish her her you know her identity as somebody who has been sexually assaulted and sexually violated from you know from from somebody who has been thrown into this mayhem into this madness without her choice she's not able to make that you know kind of distinction she the nature of response is to normalize it that you know this happened to me so if i have to survive i will have to repeat the cycle right yeah. and i i do yeah. not have any other response to it but to but to you know to lie there but to kind of you know to let these men assault me at least they're they're you know they're not murdering me yeah. sure you yeah. know I'm, I'm being raped i'm being sexually assaulted but i'm alive so i i really struggle with that mm -hmm. and and for you know for this in fact is reflected in sakina the the name of the woman in in her father's reaction he is just happy to see his daughter alive yeah that's the most important thing for him at that moment and that was kind of a uh, in this article the author really highlighted that because mm -hmm. you know it was viewed that in many cases that if a woman was unpure mm -hmm. then she was it, she may as well be dead in yeah. some cases but that was like for Monto to depict the father being mm -hmm. like I don't care about that I'm just happy that you know mm -hmm. I still have you in my life was a significant thing yeah um, and we could talk about this you know in a little bit but like a lot of the things that Monto depicted were not received well no. on the part of like the upper classes uh, or castes like by the politicians mm -hmm. they didn't want anything to do with what Monto was saying <laughs> yes. almost like they were trying to erase that past like they like don't talk about that like mm -hmm. that's not something worth mentioning yeah. but I you know I we don't have to go there yet but that's oh well yes because you know women's bodies are to be controlled by men I mean it's it's extremely distressing to see you know a woman to be in control of her sexuality like yeah. you know in Tanda Ghosh that is why Manto was you know charged for obscenity because Manto's uh, central character uh, Kalvant and uh, Ishwar Singh um, Kalvant Singh is the is is the mistress and she's sexually proactive she is confident she articulates acknowledges and acts on her desires yeah yeah that is something that is not identified with you know indian women like indian women are supposed to be like you know the culture the way the culture um um i think constructs our bodies where we are supposed to uh deliver pleasure to our male counterparts 
there's absolutely no scope of acknowledging identifying female pleasure right. or you know women enjoying sexual activity as much as their male counterpart if they do so they are you know they are you know i mean i don't know they are they're looked down upon that's that's not normal on women yeah but manto talked about the manto explicitly talked about women's bodies and the things that women enjoy and and the the and and he described the nuances of the act of the sexual you know act between a man and a woman and manto did not see any any wrong in that i mean there was consent uh, and there was mutual enthusiasm you know between ishwar singh and kalwant so for manto to be writing at a time where there was so much censure around women's bodies where women were not allowed to kind of exist beyond their caregiving yeah. responsibilities or beyond their identities as you know as the feminine presence in a man's life it was it was distressing for men because they just had no idea how to deal with women who you know with i mean fictional women characters who were so well versed about their sexuality yeah. or so much in control about their sexuality and that's that is also reflected in musel yeah yeah so yeah and 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 i find it really interesting because you know manto talks about you know women who are not who would otherwise not be accepted in the society for their fierceness for their unapologetic um, you know stance around their sexuality around their femininity or how they identify as as women that is that i think that is what really stood out in manto's writings it's it's really interesting because you know manto was playing with the characters i mean he was kind of depicting human trauma he was depicting the trauma that was a product of the of the biggest mass migration in human history but he was also kind of projecting characters women who had a voice who you know who kind of were sure what they wanted manto gave that scope to their women pr- protagonists and i mean i kind of i ha- i've been asked by some people like but manto was a man how can he be a feminist my question is i mean i do not think that feminism is a brand that only women have access to manto is a feminist because he was far ahead of his time manto is a feminist because he was you know academically i i won't say academically but uh, he was recording the trauma the madness the mayhem of partition through popular literature through fictional narratives but it was rooted in real people's lives he was talking about women's you know plight yes there might be you know some um i think some debate around but you know manto who is manto to give voice to women but i do not you know i i don't think i would want to contest that because standing in 1947 where many women did not have a voice manto was getting charged with you know obscenity and was called to the court because his protagonist had a voice because manto wanted women to have a, a voice and i think a lot has to do with the context i mean sure like today many women speak about themselves speak for themselves they do not need anybody else to speak on their behalf but in 1947 when women were being mass violated when women were being brutally raped 
when women were raped to the point that they normalized sexual violence and they normalized that, you know, getting raped is their chance to survival. Sure, Manto talking about those issues make him, you know, an advocate for women. So. I, I, my opinion would be that I agree um, because I don't think you need to be a woman per se to be mm-hmm. feminist, especially at the time, because how many writings are there from that time from actual women? Well, there were like Isma Chuktai. I mean, at the top of my head, I can think about Isma Chuktai, and there were, um, you know, some uh, authors uh, in Bengal, like I think Asha Purna Devi and, and others who were writing. But yes, not a lot, definitely. And, and for like a man at that time, like it. It seems to me like he used the privilege of being a man, considering yes, the intersectionality of the, you know, at that time, to bring these issues to light. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was persecuted, like he wasn't ever convicted or like he wasn't ever like um, found like guilty, I think, or or sentenced to anything. But no. like he was brought to court numerous yeah. times yeah. Yeah. is to me a sign that he was definitely disturbing the status quo yes. and the status quo was as you know very much still is today in in almost all parts of the world very patriarchal and mm-hmm. very you know classist and to go against that meant to in some sense embody this progressive attitude and while like yes maybe not everything he said was or wrote was by today's standards feminist writing 60 70 years mm-hmm. ago like it was it's difficult to say like no you can't be a feminist there because you were writing this at that time like we have to acknowledge yeah. uh you know time we have to acknowledge context in order to properly assess yeah. you know the yeah. validity of this the you know the person the situation mm-hmm. their efforts but again i know nothing about this i'm just uh extremely privileged white dude in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, but at least, you know, you're you're willing to know about the history of the subcontinent and, and the partition and the bloodshed. And, yeah, I kind of, um, I mean, we celebrated our 74th independent, 74th year of independence. And uh, interestingly, Again, like, you know, in the popular narratives, like, of course, there were, you know, many, many visionary men, women, uh, who laid down their lives, who fought for the independence struggle. But I kind of find, I kind of feel that it is a disservice when, you know, you're doing a disservice when you're not recognizing so many people who bore the price of the partition, the human price of the partition because of their, you know, because of their move, because of their migration, the independent states of India and Pakistan emerged. Their migration did contribute to the nation making, to the nation building. It was, you know, they they lived with the trauma. They did not seek for accountability they kind of survived through PTSD. Women survived, um, you know, women who survived sexual violence struggled to be accommodated within a society that values your worth on, you know, your, your that, that values your honor and your worth on your purity, on your sexual purity, on the way your body is touched only by your husband and not by any other man. And once any other man touches your body or violates your body, that becomes a completely different issue that you are not a part of the society. Mm -hmm. You do not belong to the society. And And I always find it very problematic the way ownership of the body revolves I find it extremely problematic that how, you know, through social constructions of identity 
and uh, of nationalism and honor it's conveniently the the honor of the nation the honor of the community is conveniently put on the woman who is then expected to uphold it to protect it without even you know consenting to it without even knowing that the honor has been put on her that she has the responsibility she did not sign up for it yeah and the moment she is violated the entire community is is brought to shame there's absolutely no discussion around you know what this woman might need what might be the immediate response to cater to her trauma to both her physical injury her emotional trauma there's absolutely no discussion around this it's always the community's honor mm-hmm. it's always how the community has been humiliated and how the ownership shifts now when the community when when the you know when the woman is um is um kind of violated sexually the community conveniently takes back the honor and you know and kind of gives the ownership of the body to the women now the body does not belong to the community the body which has been violated now belongs to the woman right it's on the it's it's now their responsibility what they want to do with their body and there's absolutely no accountability within the community to see that the women are readjusted with dignity with respect because because they did not sign up for the violence they were a conduit of the violence their bodies were used as a weapon of violence and you know a lot of discussions and there's a lot a lot of scholarly articles on how rape is used as a weapon of violence but i strongly feel that women's bodies are used to violate not only the community but also the individual women themselves i think you know while rape is definitely one of the strategies that is used by um violent communities to break the moral to to humiliate the other community it's all these women's bodies that are used against the individual woman itself and and essentially the woman does not have any autonomy or ownership on her body it either belongs to the community it either belongs to her husband and and once it you know once the woman fails to uphold to protect the honor that rests at the center of her being the community or the society collectively decides that the ownership that they that they have nothing to do with providing you know justice to this woman to providing you know her with the space where she feels safe and welcome as she feels that you know she can seek for accountability or justice for the violence that she has endured mm-hmm. violence is always i feel you know uh i feel violence is always um imagined as a very singular concept it's always about the community's violence the community that has been violated it's all and it's it's interesting how even when we are talking about rape as a weapon of war we say that oh a woman's body is used to humiliate another community but you know there's hardly any engagement with with how the women are res- are responding to their body memories to the body trauma like how the woman's body is used against her will against her consent you know to to violate her she cannot come to terms with her own body because that is how the general perception goes around body because a woman's purity is equated with you know her virginity and and how she should preserve her virginity for her husband right. and partner and in the case of india do and this might be a little bit of a strange question but is the nation framed as a woman because like in united states 
in Canada, like the nation is so often framed as like a like this this woman, like this this motherly figure, mm-hmm. or we think of like Mother Russia, mm-hmm. like the motherland. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm taking this from Sarah Ahmed and her book, um, The Cultural Politics of Emotion, when she says that the nation is almost always framed like this fragile thing that is vulnerable to attack. It needs to be protected. It needs to be protected, mm-hmm. yeah. But then it's ironic because people don't want to then protect the actual women. Like, they prefer the symbolic nation woman yes, yes. as opposed to the actual real day-to-day women yes. that they see on the street. And they'd be like, oh, well, you, you know, in the case that I can speak to in, like, Canada or, or in the North American context, like, oh, she deserved it mm-hmm. in, in the case of, like, a, a sexual assault because of what she was wearing. Like, it, she brought that upon herself. Whereas when it's, like, the nation, it's like, oh, well, we have to, we have to preserve the, the, the sanctity of the, of the nation. nation and- and, you know, that's essentially what, uh, when I said that, you know, it's, well, the idea of nation is equated with a woman and and the women of flesh and blood become the biological representation of that nation, of that community. So I think, you know, like you said that you, you know, it's, it's, it's really ironic when you, when you kind of have a feminine imagination of a landmass essentially yeah, it's, it's absurd yeah it's of a landmass but when you know when it comes to uh protecting the women and providing them with the space to address the emotional trauma the physical trauma that they go through because you know they are pushed at the front because women are kind of identified as the biological replica of the nation because it is associated with this feminine idea of the nation. Well, you know, nation is an abstract idea. Like, yeah. you know, it, it is a piece of landmass. Mm-hmm. But the more concrete representation is the biological woman of flesh and blood who is pushed at the front. And so if you want to violate the nation, you violate the woman. That's the easiest way to break the will of the country. Right. So, yeah, that's that's why I said that, you know, I mean, if you ask me, hey, Deeply, now, do you want to be, you know, do you want to become the biological representation of India? Hell right. no. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be because, I mean, I am my own person. Yeah. And I don't want my body to be equated with, anything else with with the idea of a nation with the idea of a community well you can ask you know can you can you really divorce your religious your national identity i i can't i mean as in back in india as a hindu woman i'm more privileged as a hindu brahmin woman although i do not associate with my uh you know with with my brahmin identity I am actively trying to deconstruct it because it's not only problematic, but also inherently violent. But I also recognize that because of my surname, because of my position in the caste hierarchy, the kind of violence that I face or have faced is very different from the kind of violence that women have faced in the margins, that Dalit Bahujan women face. The kind of social mobility that I have due to my caste privilege, many women do not have that. And I've, you know, David, I've, I've, I've always struggled with the idea of, uh, diso- you know, disassociating with my caste privilege. Mm-hmm. I've always asked myself, how do I break away from the caste privilege? Do I drop, you know, my surname from my name? And I was like, well. If I'm doing that, how I, I mean, I mean, that's definitely one way of kind of saying that I do not associate with my caste. But on the other hand, I kind of thought that if I keep my surname with my name, that will be a constant reminder that, you know, as a Brahmin woman, 
I have, um, in maybe in different circumstances, been associated with certain violent practices that have been inherently harmful for those at the margins, for, for women at the margins. And it's painful. It's absolutely distressing, disturbing, and painful to think that, you know, I have contributed to that violence in some form. But I also feel that there needs to be a constant reminder to unlearn, that I have to, con because unlearning is a lifelong process. I always, uh, you know, in, in my classes and also when I talk with colleagues, I kind of recognize and I always tell them that I am a product of colonization. I cannot really say that, oh, well, you know, India is a post-colonial society. Um, there are, uh, you know, we are, we are entering into the 74th year of independence. There are, well, quote unquote, equality and, um, you know, among people. But it took me a long time to identify, acknowledge, and consequently break away from the colonial biases that I grew up with. And nobody told me that, hey, those are wrong. Those are harmful practices. You're actually reproducing, you know, violent hierarchical practices. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard work. But as Sarah might say, that feminism is homework. Yeah. You have to constantly engage and, you know, ask yourself that how can I become a better ally? Mm -hmm. And to become a better ally, just symbolically, you know, dropping my surname off my name is not enough. I'd rather, you, like you said, that I'd rather use my privilege and advance and amplify the causes of those who are at the margins. I mean, that's a great... Uh, do you have anything else? <laughs> I mean, that's a great point to conclude on, but if you if you have more you want to say... <laughs> uh, well, I think I, I've... Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to, you know, to be able to talk uh, about um, the issues of uh, gender-based violence and... Yeah. Uh, because he, like yeah, you said, are, it gets erased. It's, yes, it's, it's ignored. It's mm -hmm. it's silenced. Mm -hmm. You know, some some narrative, some um, responses are recorded through oral histories, like Urvashi uh, Butalia is the other side of silence. If if any one of your listener wants to kind of you know is interested and wants to read more about it, that's a very good resource. Um, and uh, I think. Uh, there's a lot about, you know, there's a lot to unpack, especially when we talk about post-coloniality, when we talk about post-colonial societies, because I, I, I mean, I, I do not suppose that you can talk about post-coloniality and post-colonial societies and, you know, nation building without acknowledging the voices that, that are at the margins that have been systematically silenced and the bodies on which the nation is built. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's all from me. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Well, great. So if anyone listened this far, uh, thank you. I want to thank Duplina for coming and, you know, teaching me about this because I knew very little about uh, the partition and what it meant for people, women especially. Um, and yeah, if you, if you listened this far, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll leave some links in the description, some of Duplina's uh, writings and stuff that you can find there. Um, yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Take care. If you want to say bye, Duplina says bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>